Psalm 133. We'll probably even cover 134 too a little bit. Actually, what we're going to end up doing is going and just kind of quick glance and learn a little bit about Psalm 120 to 134 because they all kind of go together. Um, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, that last song that Dave sang, I, I was one of those kids too like him that grew up in church and decided pretty young I needed to I needed to get saved. And that's a pretty dra- dramatic event that happened for me, something I'll never, ever forget the day I gave my heart to the Lord, even at eight years old. I remember every detail of it. I'm not going to go over it again right now, but every detail of it. And then a couple of years later, my whole world fell apart. My mom and dad decided to get a divorce. Well, my dad decided. And hung in there for a little while. And then just kind of dove off the deep end myself for a few years. But remembering what God had already done in my heart and that those first couple of years of all that, there's a verse in Hebrews toward the end that uh, is chapter 13, verse 5 in it. It says, let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And it was just that last quote there that the writer of Hebrews attributes to Jesus. That as a kid, I knew that. I just knew that verse because of pastor preaching on it, whatever. And that's all I knew. That's all I knew, man. When everything started falling apart, that's all I, all I, all I knew. But I grew up as a kid with a lot of fear, even before all that. And I tried to memorize the verses that talk about fear. Paul writing to Timothy, God's not giving us a spirit of fear, but a power and love and a sound mind. And as a kid, you just don't even wrap your head around all that, except for that. All I could really understand was God didn't give me a spirit of fear, but I still was afraid of everything. I was little. I mean, when I say I was little, when I got married, I was a full 100 pounds lighter than I am now. So, little. I, I wasn't done growing even when we got married. And, and not just here. It was, <laughs> everywhere, I grew more. <laughs> um, yeah. So, uh, there was that. And I, you know, you... you you go into the military for a while and some of us were talking about our time in, in the military and you, you kind of get this hero mentality even before that. I, I just knew that the person that I married, I wasn't going to do what my dad did. We talked about it. My wife and I talked about it. We got married four days after her 18th birthday. Man, we ran away and got married. It, it's, that's another whole long story. I'm not going to really get into all the details. Don't have time for it. it's crazy but you know there were there were reasons we thought we needed to do that i i won't say that we were right in what we did necessarily but um we made life a lot harder on ourselves probably than we had to um but you know about two years into that i was pretty sure it was going to end like my dad's marriage And, again, another progression of events with my oldest daughter, who's now has four kids of her own and and, uh, married to this guy right here for nine years, nine years this year. And uh, the Lord brought me back. But I kind of became... Still, this hero mentality just kicked up some more. You know, first I had to save my wife from the situation, uh, both true and perceived, and then I had to go save the world. And and because the Air Force told me I could, I went in for a job. But you know, then they convinced me that I could save the world, and so that's that's what we were doing. We were fighting the bad guys, and then Desert Storm kicked up, and it just ricked it up even more. And and uh, when I got out. 
I became very hyper vigilant about the safety of my family and taking care of them and making sure that they were protected. I mean, we went to the mall. I turned into, you know, secret service. I just, I watched everybody, everything. And it didn't help that in that, in that time period, then my mom went to work for the National Child Safety Council. So then I hear all these things that are going on and all these abductions and what happens and how you find the kids, how do you identify your kids. So I knew what my daughter was wearing all the time. We got a, We went to Disney World one time with some friends and 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 – she was probably six, seven, maybe eight, the age of our youngest daughter now. And we, we went on Small World, harmless ride, right? Everybody hates that. I love it, to be honest with you, because I always go in the middle of the day when it's hot, always, like I go all the time. But, you know, every time I've been there, it, it's an air-conditioned ride. It takes forever. You get a nice, long, slow, cool-down rest period. You learn a song in about 10 different languages. It's it's great. I love it. And so, you know, we're pointing out all the stuff, and we get off the ride, and we're with this other couple. We just get off the ride, and we start walking out. And I look over at my wife, and I realize she doesn't have my daughter. And I'm thinking, all right, well, she's got to be. She's not right here. And and so I told him, hey, we got to stop. And, and if you've ever been there, the, the hallway out is huge. There's a lot of people there. So I lined up my wife and our two friends across. said, don't move. And I started going back upstream. And thankfully, my daughter, because she listened and, and, and just kind of had had a father who was always looked for a safe place kind of thing, she had gotten herself into a corner in the hallway and just stayed there. And, and I got her. I got to her, brought her back out. And, uh, you know, a lot of relief, a lot of guilt. So just wrapped it up even more. And God really had started dealing with me because it got to a point where I didn't like my wife and daughter to be away from me at all. And it was first, it was easy because my wife didn't drive. And she had her driver's license and all, but we had a stick shift in, and uh, she didn't like trying to drive the stick. And, and got to the point where she just kind of refused to drive it. And, uh, but when we moved back to Michigan, we didn't have a stick shift anymore. And she was, you know, getting a little braver and going out and, and you know, they're, all the women in my family are directionally challenged. And, you know, but she would go a little farther each time. And then pretty soon she's going all the way across the state without me. And I'm freaking out. They're not here. What happens if something happens? And they're all right, well, I'm getting to that. <laughs> yeah. So I would freak out. Literally, my heart would pound the whole time. I would be anxious the whole time. And God really had to deal with me on that. And one night we're sitting in our little bitty house, and, and uh, we're just sitting there. And I'm watching them. They're just watching TV, or my wife might have been talking on the phone, whatever. But... Remember the Lord speaking to me and saying, do you trust me with them? I'm like, yeah, of course I trust you with them. But I knew what he was talking about. This is like he said, if somebody came through that door right now, what could you possibly do to stop them? And I realized I didn't really trust them to take care of my family. And, and I was just kind of... It's time to start dealing with this because I had just gone over the top with it. So it, it wasn't something just immediate, something I've had to kind of kick down and, and not, not completely. I still am, you know, if we go to the mall, man, hyper vigilant. I know the statistics. I know, I know who gets grabbed. I know who to look for. I, I, anything I can take in to, to make sure my family's safe. And I'm quite discouraged the fact that even out in the middle of nowhere where we lived, I have to be careful that I can't just let my youngest daughter go out by herself all the time. You know, like I used to do in the city and go and run. And uh, so, but I think I was doing pretty good. I've always been to some pastor's conferences and, and most of the time my my problem is just that I just miss her. I like her to be there with me all the time. It's not so much that I feel like I have to keep her safe and, and, and 
hold on to her because God can't. I mean, I get a little nervous about it, but I just have to keep giving it back to him, give it back to him. And I was doing, I was, I was doing okay. And then a few years ago, we had some family issues and, and, uh, some of you know what the, what the problem was and, um, one of our sons became a threat to the family and for about three years God just let me go back to hypervigilant I slept very little even after he was gone and I knew he was away from us it was three months before I slept completely through a night and but it was needed it was needed to be on that kind of high alert all the time. And and I look back at the time, and I don't feel like God was ever telling me during that period, you need to calm down, you need to put this into my hands. I put it into his hands, and I flat out asked him, Lord, whatever has to happen, you give me the wisdom to discern the moment. You give me the strength to take and do what I have to do in the moment. I had given him that whole thing. And now we're on the other side of that. Not 100%, but we're on the other side of it for the most part. And so this last Sunday, and, and we've been going through the, through the Sermon on the Mount. This last Sunday, I had to preach on worry. Matthew chapter 6, right? Don't worry. Don't worry. Worry. The words came out of my mouth. Worry and, and anxiousness completely consuming you. That's sin. That can be sin. You take it too far, you go over the top, it's sin. I'm like, all right, I know what's coming up this week, Lord. Why do I have to do this right right now? Because three days later, I dropped my wife and my 20-year-old daughter off at an airport, and they went to New York City for the last four days <laughs> with two other women. It, it's not... <laughs> you know, it's not like, you know, somebody took their husband and he's the bodyguard or nothing, nothing like that. Something else that I've been noticing through going through the, the Sermon on the Mount, and, and it's really just been kind of on me anyways in the last couple of months is, do you really, you really trust my promises? And it must be something that the Lord is just trying to get to the church right now. Anyways, because I've heard a number of different pastors and preachers preach on that. Faith. What is faith? Do you really trust God's promises? Can we really trust God's promises? Do you trust God's word? Do you trust that this is the word of God? Or do you believe that it just contains the words of God? That this is words of men that have the word of God in it. You know, and... When I'm preaching, I can be pretty bold about it. I can be pretty authoritative about it. I can be stand here and say, this is God's word beginning to end. <clears throat> Spoken, written through men, but, but it is his word. It's not theirs. And uh, so then it was, all right, it's time to come back down off of that. You got everything this week. <laughs> God said, it's time. We're going to deal with it again because you, you're not letting go of this. I was completely depressed on Tuesday because I knew my wife was leaving on Thursday. I'm like, she's like, you're right. Said, oh, one, I'm just missing you already. You're not even gone yet. <clears throat> and that's kind of where I left it with her. But in my heart, I'm going to, you're going to a place I know is not safe at any given moment. And not just not safe because they have gangs there, not just safe because, it, you know, there's a high amount of homeless people there. It's a terrorist target. I mean, we just had a guy drive through a crowd at Times Square. Their hotel is at Times Square and Broadway. They're right there. Dude drove through and killed what, 25 people or something like that a few months ago. I'm like, Lord, I didn't need that right before they're going to leave. We already knew they were going on the trip. I didn't need to see that. And then I think, do we have a, a New York City police officer, a, a female that just got shot last week, week before? I don't need to see those things right before they leave. 
and then preach on worry, and then you're going to make me live by what I preach. It's not fair. Let me deal with it for a little while first, so then just yeah, heap it on. And I have friends like Joe who works for Destiny Rescue, and I see all that stuff. And, we, and he's at our church, and he's telling us everything. And, and, and we have all these other parents that have adopted kids like, like ours and like our son who, is, who is, has all these problems. I mean, we've adopted two boys. So we've got, we've got the, the best of adoption in one and the worst of adoption in the other as far as adoption experiences. Most families only get one experience. We got both. You know, thankful for both, actually, because going through that, that bad one has opened up a door for us to reach out and to speak to and to, and to love on and to, to encourage so many other families out there. And in our church, you guys have had the opportunity to bless those families yourself sometimes. You don't even know it. Sometimes they've come in and just being around you guys is good. The fact that you will let me go sometimes to go and, and talk to people. The, the fact that it, I think everybody here who was a part of that church knew the story while we were going through it. And, and encouraged us and lifted us up and prayed for us. And, and, and it was amazing. And, and I go through that and I get to this week and I'm going, why can't I just trust you? How is it that I can't believe your promises are for me? And I've been there not just in this one particular instance, but I've been there for about two months, three months, and a whole bunch of different things. It's about every area of my life. Lord, why? Why can't I just trust you with this? Why can't I tell everybody else your promises are for them? Why can I encourage them, but then I sit and, and I look at them for myself and try to believe that they're there for me. And how come I can't? Why do I have such a hard time? I'm a pastor. I believe they're good. I believe when I tell somebody else, believe in these promises. They're for you. You can have, God loves you. And I turn around. And. It's hard. It's hard for me. So I had to preach on worry and I had to let my wife and daughter go. And we've been talking a lot about prayer and being specific in our prayers and I'm praying for big things and sometimes even things that maybe sound outrageous. Like camps that we don't have any money for. And in and, and ministries that we don't have anybody to man. And, and why not, right? He's God. If he wants us to do it, we'll just pray for it. And we're going to start moving in that direction. And the people will be there and the money will be there if that's what he wants us to do. If he doesn't, he'll stop us or he'll just slow us down until it's time. So I prayed for my wife and my daughter, these other two ladies. I prayed, Lord, you got to do this because I'm not going to go. I know where you're taking me personally, so let me just put it out here. There's my request for you. Surround them completely. Big, big angels. I want them to have an escort everywhere they go. And I'm kind of feeling foolish because I'm thinking, I know they're there. And I, and, I, and kind of like, do I really have to ask God for this? Doesn't matter. I'm going to ask God for this. And Lord, just cover them with the Holy Spirit and protect them. So we get a story. I get a story from my wife today. And I've kind of been expressing this to her a little bit through the trip. When we have our little text moments and telling her kind of where I've been and, and what I'm doing. And so she, she kicks back to me. Well, here's what, here's what happened today. Here's how we were protected today. Or she's just telling us stories about, you know, like yesterday they were in the, in the subway and there was a guy who was from the Crip gang and then two more of them got on at the next stop and then they did their little drug exchange in her car. 
their car and and did their little drug exchange and then they got off at more stops and 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 people have said to them giving them bad directions off the subway or which subway to get on and as soon as that person's done talking to them and walks away there's another person standing right there and pulls them aside hey listen that person was wrong or they're sending you to a wrong spot this is where you need to go because we've been protecting them all the way so we were talking about it this morning a little bit right before they left the hotel and they leave the hotel to go to the next theater that they're at and she says there's two look like homeless guys probably running some kind of a scam and they see them they see the ladies coming and one of them she hears them one of them say them and the other guy says no no they smell like oranges or something something natural just leave them alone I'm like what she said so you know evidently oils keep scammers away yeah. yeah I'm like I'm like yeah right so no I said listen I just fired back with the thing that smells sweet to our Lord and to his people is repulsive to the world and they wouldn't even mess with you. So God's just dealing with me. Every day I've had to put it back into their hands. Into his hands, I mean, not their hands. Well, not their hands. You know, and my, my wife and my daughter and these other two ladies are coming home from theaters at night as this is all part of a theater group thing and and, and they're coming back at, at night, walking back from Broadway to their hotel room. And, and at like 10, 11, 12 o'clock at night, four women, streets of New York, walking back to their room. <clears throat> and I no, I don't go to sleep until I hear they're back in the room. So, you know. But at that point, I've got to give it back because in my head, I'm going, all right, if I get a phone call, if I get a bad phone call, you know, what do I do? Do I remember anything about New York? Do I pull it up? You know, I'm already, it's stupid. Just pray, man. Let him get back to the room and God will take care of it. He gets all the glory for it and I'm not going to take any credit for it at all. And he promised me, and that's what he keeps asking me. Do you, do you believe that I'm going to I'm going to do what you've asked me to do. This, this is not an unreasonable request to protect your family when they're away from you. Do you really believe you're asking me to do this? Do you believe I'll do it for you? And in everything else in my life that I've had to ask for that I, in, in the last few months was I've been dealing with these promises and faith and prayer and, and that question just kind of went right back through all of it. Do you really believe? Even in the Sermon on the Mount. The way he ends that section with, on his teaching about worry, ends with, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Because if you're seeking his kingdom, you're seeking his righteousness, your requests are going to be righteous requests. And the things you're asking for, you can believe that God is going to do what's in your best interest is probably the better way to put it. You may not always get what you request, but you know what? You're going to be with okay with what you get. Because you're going to be seeking his kingdom and his righteousness. So even if things don't turn out exactly the way that you want, they're going to turn out exactly the way that you need and you're going to recognize it. And sometimes we get stripped right down to nothing. It's like Martha and Mary. When Lazarus died, Jesus said, you, do you believe, basically, is what he's asking her.
you're gonna see you're gonna see him again and Martha what did Martha say I know I'll see him again in the resurrection she believed she believed everything Jesus was teaching them and he said I am the resurrection and I am the life right and when it all came down to it after some other questions that he asked her she just it, it comes down to the base of her faith I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who has come into the world. If there's nothing else, if everything else is shaken, if everything else is wiped clean, the foundation is that. We believe in Jesus and we believe he is who he said he is. So what's that got to do with Psalm 133? I don't know. We'll get to that in just a second. Let's pray first. Father, we just ask now that you would give us understanding of your word. Lord, pour out your spirit upon us. And Lord, I pray if there's anybody else here struggling with the same fears that I've been struggling with. The same questions and or even, Lord, they're questioning you and questioning whether you love them or questioning whether you truly sent them in the direction they've been going or that you have truly change their life because they're struggling with their past like I was. Lord, I pray you would speak to them at this very moment. And give them assurance of your presence in their life, your love for them. And Lord, that you have never left them and you've never forsaken them. So Lord, just open up your word to us now. In Jesus' name, amen. So how did I get to Psalm 133? Well, just to show me really how fragile I, I, I am, after we took our wives to the ho or to the airport on Wednesday, and they had to be in Grand Rapids at five o'clock in the morning, which means we got up at like two forty-five and got ready and got going and met up with the other couple and and drove up there. So I came home just in time to take my son to to work and and his buddy off to to work out in the cornfield, and I came home and my eight-year-old was awake, and uh, you know. They tend to be a little hungry in the morning, and so you got to feed them. And and uh, then they want she oh, she's a talker. If you know her mom, it's not a surprise, but she's just like I don't know, like somebody just pull the rip cord on the lawnmower and it just goes. And and sometimes one subject just blends into the next one. You don't even know that you've changed anything. She just keeps going and keeps going. Even if you talk, honey, you need to slow down just a little bit. Just calm down just a little bit okay and by this you know it just keeps right on going and and not a add her attention's on everything fully she she knows what she's talking about so i came home and in the middle of the day i started feeling kind of puny and i'm thinking well, i'm just tired from getting up so early and not not much sleep and 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 I, I'd already arranged with Ron for him to do Wednesday night because on Sunday I wasn't exactly sure even when we were going to the airport. And, and so I just told him, be ready. You just do it whether I'm here or not. You know, so he was ready. And and uh, I really had intended to kind of I stopped by the church to do a couple things. I intended to get out of here before everybody got here. And instead, uh, everybody got here before I could get out. And I just kept feeling more and more just like man i gotta go home go to bed so i i didn't stay for bible study i just i took off i went to the store picked up a few things and about halfway through doing that i just everything went slow motion just like oh now i'm not just tired i'm sick <laughs> i'm sick and by the time i got home there was a fever man i had a fever for a day and a half and i used to get bad fevers i haven't had one in a long time and they would last a long time. And then you have days of a headache and your neck is stiff and, and all that. So I've had that. I've, I've had the, the fever headache for the last two days. But it took me that time to, to, to break that. 
And, you know, I'm telling everybody, don't tell mom, I'm, uh, you know, don't tell, don't even tell grandma. My mother-in-law lives with us during the summer. Don't even, don't even tell grandma. I don't want mom to know while she's in New York. I don't want her to worry about me. And, uh, so the kids were able to take care of themselves for the most part and, and, uh, just kind of push through and, and finally the fever broke, but it was just kind of God's way of saying, let me show you just how fragile you really are, buddy. You worried about this. Not only do you not get to worry about this, but let me take you down another notch and just knock you down for a while. And then Roger called or texted me and he says, Hey, father-in-law's not doing well. Don't expect him to make it very much longer. And, and by the way, Pastor Roger, if you don't know, Pastor Roger was supposed to, from Kalamazoo, was supposed to teach tonight, but you know, he got called out to Arizona. His father-in-law did pass away the other day, so we pray for the family, and and uh, they're dealing with the loss, but he's a believer, so they're kind of mourning with celebration. And uh, so it's, it's good. So I'm like, Lord, it's too late to call anybody else. What do I do? Do I do Matthew 6? I'm going to kind of live through this. I don't really want to do it again. <laughs> Do I do what I'm going to do Sunday morning? Do I do? I don't even know what I'm going to do Sunday morning right now. You know, Lord, what? What? I'm just kind of out of it. And I just kept getting Psalm 133. I'm like, Psalm 133. Okay, I don't even remember what it is. But all right. And a few hours went by and thinking, Psalm 133. Why are we doing Psalm 133? So I looked it up finally. You can see what it says. It says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together in unity. I'm like, Lord, that's perfect for a men's, men's get-together, a couple different churches together. Sometimes, I mean, we've had as many as eight different churches represented in one of these things. So, I think mean, this is good. How, how, how good and how pleasant it is for the brethren to, get, to dwell together in unity. And I started thinking about that, and I'm like, okay, so it's good and pleasant for us. We like it. Right? We like to be together. We like to eat. We, we like to talk about the military, talk about, you know, whatever we want to talk about. Our voices drop a couple octaves. We don't have to sing up in the rafters because there's no soprano up there. You know, right? everything's pretty comfortable for us. We can be men. It's not really what it's talking about. It's brethren. This is people together. And he's talking about Israel specifically, the, the brethren, the, the 12 tribes, dwelling together in unity and if your if your bible has um the little headings in the beginning of the chapters one of the headings you'll see there's a song of ascent of david and so from 120 to 134 they're all they'll all have that heading on there a song of ascent and what that's talking about is people who are on their way to jerusalem would kind of recite or, or focus on or, or think on, meditate on these particular psalms. Because everybody, when you go to Jerusalem, you're always going up to Jerusalem. You know, here, if we go up north, we know we're heading up to the UP. Or if you guys are from Indiana, if you go north, you're heading into Michigan. Um, so, you know, we know which way is north, and we always say that's up. But it doesn't matter where you're at in Israel or for any Jew in the world, you're going up when you go to Jerusalem because it's on a mountain. So you're always going up. And so it's good and it's pleasant for the brethren to dwell together in unity. So they would think on these things and, and three times a year, three different feasts, Passover, Pentecost, and I believe day of atonement, every able-bodied Jewish man within the right distance was required to be in Jerusalem at that time. And some estimates of, of the population growth in Jerusalem on these days, like on Passover when Jesus when Jesus was, was crucified, they would grow by millions. I've seen everything from up to 6 million people in that city for that time. And, and so you have all these pilgrims, all these travelers coming in together in the same time maybe a day or two ahead of time or four days ahead of time. And they're coming in and they're going up. And so you can imagine that picture. You look up as you're on your way up. Or maybe from David's perspective, maybe he's already in Jerusalem. He's looking down on everybody coming up. And it's, it's warming his heart. 
And he said, Lord, isn't this beautiful? Isn't this awesome for the brethren to come together to worship you? And I think David's expressing God's heart as much as he's expressing his own. I, I think God loves it when we all get together. Whether it's a, a men's thing here, whether it's a Sunday morning, a Wednesday evening, or whatever your midweek might be, a men's Bible study, a women's Bible study. When he sees his church coming together now, it still applies. I think God still looks down and it warms him to see us willing to come together. To get rid of everything else. To forget about everything else. And if you go back to Psalm 120 and you begin to go through these, and you can even just glance back at just the headings right now, you'll see... It, this is a, a progression of people as, they, as they're going up to Jerusalem to worship, they're letting go. They're letting go of sin. They're letting go of contempt for other people. Not the contempt of other people on them, but their own contempt toward other people. They're embracing the joy of the Lord. They're, they're embracing the, the promise of, of deliverance. And their heart is building as they go. And I think back on our Sunday mornings, and I don't know what yours are like, but mine are chaos. I thought it would be easier after it wasn't five kids at home, it was only two. I thought it would be easier. I thought we'd be able to get to church on time. I, I, I thought it would be easier to wake up two kids and get them going better, more than five kids. It's not. And, and you're still saying the same things. How come you didn't have this together last night? Why? Well, we're, you're not going to your friend's house on Saturday anymore. We're going to be just be locked up in the house and ready to go for Sunday morning. I'm the pastor. I have to be on time. I, I can't keep being late. They're going to, they're going to, well, they're not going to fire me, but they're going to quit coming. I'm driving the other car. You don't have gas for the other car. Huh? Hurry up. By the time I get to the door here, I'm going, I still got to preach. I don't even remember what I was going to preach on now. I don't even remember which way the sermon was going. It's a good thing I know the reference because I don't know, uh, what am I going to do? And my whole, I've got to go sit and hide in my office, not so I don't see other people, but because I got to pull myself together. I got to let go of all that garbage. And then I'm praying, Lord, Lord. Oh, in fact, if you're here on a Sunday morning and I have our opening prayer, I'm praying for the people who are late. Lord, please prepare them before they get here. As they're coming. And this is what I'm praying for, for these Psalms, for these people. I didn't even know it until the other day. This is what I'm praying for. As they are ascending and in fact let that be our hearts on sunday morning tomorrow morning when you're going go with the heart of ascension you're going up to church not descension like you're going to descend on the place and your presence is going to be known you are letting it all go you're going to ascend to where god has taken you and you're going to be in his presence and you give him your heart And you're going to let him do in you. You're going to hear his word. You're going to worship him. And just all the things you think need to be fixed. Just unpack them before you get there. And say, Lord, these are all yours. Now just take me. And show me what you want me to do. If there's somebody here who needs to be loved on, who just needs a smile, Lord, put it on my face. Let me serve you. Show me what to do. Speak through me. And trust him with that life piece that you think needs to be fixed before you can do anything else. Trust him with that. Because he wants it. 
He wants you. Here's another picture in this in, in Psalm 133, verse 2. It says, that It is like precious oil upon the head, running down the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down the edge of the garments. It's like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. And listen, I, I had that conversation with my wife before I read that part. You might think it's kind of funny that, you know, they, the dudes smelled her oil and, and, and the oils or whatever. I don't know how many of you have wives or whatever that, that are into that essential oils. And, and every time you turn around, you think you're coughing and they're spraying you with stuff. I, it happens. I actually, I like the stuff. It, but anyhow. But those guys were like, man, they smell like natural. They smell like oranges. And and I can think about this. This is this is us to God. And and the the comment that he that I made to her, I believe, was a word that God gave to me for us. That what is smell sweet to the Lord and to his people is repulsive to the world. Well, we can leave off the repulsive to the world on Sunday morning. I mean, the fact that we're gathering inside of a building, that's repulsive to a world. Don't focus on being repulsive to the world. Just enjoy being a sweet aroma. Your praise, your worship of God rising up like a sweet aroma to our Lord. think on that and this is an image that we don't really know we don't know what it's like to have oil dumped on us i mean even my wife doesn't do that to me she might mist me a little bit or put in one of them they call them diffusers but they're really just miniature vaporizers like we had when we were kids you know they dump the eucalyptus stuff in there and when you got stuffy that's all it is it's the same thing they just call it a diffuser now because they stick oil in it but They would take the oil, and when they anointed somebody, it's not even like we do on Sunday morning. I mean, somebody comes up and asks for prayer, and I'm going to put an anoint them with oil. Man, I put a little bitty dot on my, on my finger, and I make sure I get it on their forehead and not in their hair, and it doesn't drip any on their clothes and stain the clothes. And I'm worried about all that stuff. What a, what a distraction from what I'm actually doing in the moment. What they would do is they would take a vial of oil and they would hold it up over the high priest and they would dump it on his head and it would run down his hair and run down his beard and run down his clothes. So he was covered with it. And it was a fragrant oil. It wasn't just olive oil, plain old olive oil. It was a fragrant oil. And David is, is imagining that. What it must have been like the first time Aaron was anointed to be the leader of the worship of the people of Israel when they first became a nation. And he's looking down and now, Lord, look at this. They're all coming together to worship you. And you know they all have their problems. They didn't just Israel was no more just guaranteed good life without death, without sin. It was constant with them. It's like it's constant with us. But they would come. They would come because they needed to come. They needed to be forgiven. The sacrifices need to be made. We don't have to make the sacrifice anymore. The one sacrifice was made once and for all, Jesus Christ. His blood covers all of our sin. We don't have to make any more sacrifice. But we're covered. The oil would even speak of the Holy Spirit. And that picture of, of it running down Aaron or David when he was anointed king or anybody else that would have things poured on them to be anointed. And being symbolic of the Holy Spirit pouring out over that person. And how beautiful it is to God.
We're beautiful to him. In Ephesians, Paul tells us we are an inheritance to God. He's not just our inheritance. He sees us as an inheritance. All the stuff in our lives, all the things that, that we've lived through, fear, sin, worry, anxiety, all the things that, that, that distract us from him. And he still sees us as an inheritance. He sees value in us. He sees this picture. He sees you anointed with the Holy Spirit. He looks at how awesome that is. How pleasant that is. And he says it's like the dew descending on Mount Hermon. Descending upon the mountain of Zion. I've noticed the dew lately. We've had a lot of uh, heavy, heavy dew around here lately. In fact, when we're on our way to work, we come over this hill, or on the way taking my son to work, come over this hill, get to the stop sign, and there's this little field that it's a dip down away from us. And the other day, it was just this beautiful sight because there was this fog, a real thin, light fog, but it was about 20, 30 feet above the ground, above that, above that field. And you could see the wet field. This, look clean and the sun just kind of bouncing off that fog and, and how beautiful that is how amazing the things that God has done to bring us joy simple things like just looking out and seeing a sunset a sunrise the dew on a field how it makes everything clean first thing in the morning How it just kind of, like the oil on Aaron, like the dew on these mountains, on Mount Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. And the first thing I thought of is John chapter 3. Where's Jesus when Nicodemus comes to see him? He says, God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever would believe in him would have everlasting life, a life forevermore. Would not perish, but would have everlasting life. He pronounces and declares the blessing. He commanded the blessing from there. He did this. What David was picturing, and I don't know if this would be deemed prophetic or not, but what David is seeing and what David is dreaming and what David is taking in this sight, Jesus played out with Nicodemus. Declaring that blessing, and it's a blessing, and it's a promise. And somehow, Christians, we think that that's the last promise that is. It's like it's the only promise that's easy for us to believe. But I'm not sure that that's always easy for us to believe. God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He came for all of us. We find out later in that, in, in that chapter, the world's already condemned. He didn't come to judge the world. The world was already condemned. He came to seek and to save the lost. He came to save the world. In anybody, anybody. He's not going to force himself on anybody, but he, anybody who will come. Anybody who will believe. And he 
anybody will start that journey to ascend to him. Life is waiting. Freedom is waiting from fear and worry and anxiety, from addiction, from whatever. Whatever's enslaved us. Whatever stinking chains from our past we keep picking up and trying to drag with us. We're free from those. We can trust him. Whatever promise, whatever God's called you to do. Listen, if he's called you to do something, he has called you to do something. We're all supposed to preach the gospel, all of us. We're all supposed to say, we're all supposed to speak the gospel, not just live it out. We're all supposed to speak it. It's a spoken word. All of us. He's going to empower us to do it. He says he will. And we can trust him. It doesn't mean you won't face opposition. In fact, if you do that, guaranteed, you'll face opposition. Guaranteed. The enemy doesn't like it when the word goes out. Listen, you guys. God's with us. He's with us. Read these Psalms of Ascent. Prepare your heart on Sunday, on, on midweek, whenever you're going to go and worship Him. Prepare your heart. Let Him examine you. You know, we kind of focus on that on, on, on days, on, on Sundays when we're going to do communion. The pastor, I do it. Hey, man, prepare you. Let God examine you first. Before you come, don't just come up, grab the stuff, and go back and munch on it. It's not a snack. You know, <laughs> let God check your heart. If there's anything you need to get rid of, anything you need to ask forgiveness of, then do it and then go come and have communion with you because this is what he wants. But I'm telling you guys, we need to do this more than just on a communion Sunday. Every time we're coming together, God sees this as a beautiful, pleasant thing. It's a, it's a sweet aroma to him. It's this beautiful picture to him. And his people ascending to worship. And one day, one day, guys, that, that ascent, it won't stop at the church building. <laughs> One day the ascent goes all the way to heaven. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for what you've been doing in me this week and, and in giving this word. And Lord, you know how much of it you have just given since I stepped behind this pulpit. Lord, I pray that I didn't say anything out of line. If I did, I pray nobody heard it. But only the words that came from you. Lord, prepare our hearts for tomorrow as we go to worship you. As we come together as, as a whole church all over this world, Lord. May it be just like a giant wave on this earth as your people begin to praise and worship and honor you and just watch it ripple, Lord, as it covers the entire earth. May you be glorified. May you be blessed and honored tomorrow and even right from this very moment to the rest of our lives, Lord. May we know in our hearts that we can return with confidence to you for forgiveness for a filling of the spirit for whatever we have need of may we always have the confidence in our hearts to know that we can come and ask that we can come and seek and the promises that come with that to find to hear to 
and have the doors open for us. Because you love your kids, you give good gifts. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.